Welcome to Mercy Unbound. I'm Dr. Brian Thatcher, a series that aims to provide hope, an avenue for healing, and one that will help you better understand the great mercy of God. In today's show, I'll be speaking with Dr. Ray, a doctor, father, author, nationally syndicated radio host, and even has his own television show, Living Right with Dr. Ray. Are you one of those neurotic parents afraid to discipline? Do you think you can talk and reason with your child? Discipline isn't needed. Are your current methods ineffective? What about spanking? Today, we will discuss his book, Discipline, that lasts a lifetime. It's a great read. You can get it at Dr. Dr. Ray, drray.com. I strongly encourage you to get it. I read it. It's a wonderful read. And it helped me out because we're struggling in our own rights right now. Welcome, Dr. Ray. And, Thank uh, you, Brian. Appreciate it. Really appreciate you being here today. In your book, Discipline That Lasts a Lifetime, you talk about the guilt, frustration, uncertainty associated with discipline. Sometimes it seems it causes parents to be neurotic almost. Um, experts say you don't need it and that you can just talk and reason with children. Let's, before we get into this, let's define our terms. What is discipline and what effect does it have? Definition of discipline, Brian, is as broad as the culture itself. Some experts say discipline is any kind of teaching. For our purposes, let's define discipline as having a standard and expectations enforced by consequences. You mentioned in your book that parents are generally the most loving disciplinarians. And, and, if, and if they don't do the discipline, who's going to end up doing it? Parents feel guilty. Uh, I have to believe, even though I haven't lived throughout human history, I have to believe that this level of guilt among parents now was never in human history among parents. Part of the reason is they think the discipline is mean. Ooh, can't we just all get along? Can't we reason? Can't we set up win-win scenarios? Can't we use I messages? Can't we use positive reinforcement and sticker systems? All of which can help, but they do not negate the need for discipline. It's always had to be there. When parents say they feel terrible about disciplining, I tell them, okay, but then the world will discipline your child, a judge, a landlord, an army sergeant, a police officer, an employer. I shudder at this next one, a wife. Somebody's going to teach them and the world hurts. And I tell parents, you do not want the world to discipline your children. The world doesn't love your children. You said in your book that the will to discipline makes discipline less necessary. Can you explain that? If a parent is willing to act, when they have to, even, go, even though it goes against their desire. I mean, I don't like doing this. I don't like putting you in a quarter. I don't like making you write an essay. I don't like taking your privileges from you. I don't like seeing your reaction when I do all these things. I don't like the fact that you don't understand why I'm doing all these things. But if a parent is willing to do that because they know it's for the long-term good, the child reads that the child comes to understand my mom, my dad will act. They will do what they think is best. I can count on it. Once the child knows that, they do not push anywhere near as hard. And as a result, you don't have to discipline as much. Do you think children, don't they really want some sort of consistency uh, in all this? Yes and no. At the time it's happening, they don't. They're not going to say, hey, dad, hey, thanks for, uh, thanks for taking my privileges away from me. I really appreciate this. And this is going to help me when I'm 34. No, they don't understand it. However, in the long term, what it does is it actually improves the relationship. When a parent is frustrated, uses a lot of words, nags, argues, threatens, yells, screams, negotiate, over talks the relationship can get full of friction and it's ugly. It's unpleasant. How many parents go to confession? Bless me, father. I used to be a nice person before I had children. I talk to people nice. I can't believe what comes out of my mouth. And part of that is if you're unwilling to act when you need to act, 
you can get ugly and you can get ugly real fast. So yeah, in the long term, the discipline is a very healthy thing to a relationship. While you were talking, it reminded me of the saying, you know, short-term pain for long-term gain. And because uh, isn't the purpose of discipline really to teach your children the morals and what's right and wrong and how to react to certain situations? Where the experts have confused parents is, for example, this. Discipline doesn't teach. Discipline just makes the child respond to punishment. He will not internalize your lesson. I get that. I get that from religious parents all the time. They will say to me, okay, yeah, I can make him write an essay for disrespect, but that's not teaching him respect. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You have to, in fact, Brian, are you an MD? Yes. So you know you have to stop pathology before you can heal. You can't let the pathology sit there and go, well, okay, we're going to try to make the body compensate. You got to get rid of the pathology. So the discipline stops a lot of the naturally bad behavior that comes from human beings, i.e. kids, sometimes they're human. And then you can, in fact, build upon the positive stuff. I, I can't teach you to respect people as long as I'm allowing you to disrespect people. How's that going to happen? Yeah. Yeah, kind of an oxymoron. You um, brought up three rules in your book that I'd like you to discuss. Uh, first, the parent is the parent. Two, it is not what is psychologically correct, but morally correct. And then the a focus you had on effectiveness in discipline. The parent is a parent sounds kind of simplistic, doesn't it? I mean, people are thinking, what? You paid money for that book because the guy said the parent's the parent. What that means is you're the one who decides the best way to raise your child according to your morals and values. Most secular experts do not think like people of traditional religion. They don't. Small example, Brian, go to the computer and type in child and self-esteem you will see literally millions and millions and millions of options because the experts believe self-esteem is the preeminent moral virtue. Type in child and humility, a fraction, a fraction. When is the last time you heard an expert, a secular expert talk about humility? But humility is a virtue that people of religion we know especially well. Judeo-Christian religion want to teach. Yeah, you want to teach that to your kids. Okay, that's the first thing. So the parent has to be the one to decide what kind of moral direction they're going to go with this child. Not doctor, you will feel good. Secondly, the question, is it normal, is replacing the question, is it right? Dr. Ray, is it normal for a child to throw temper tantrums at age three? Dr. Ray, is it normal that my son's room is a pigsty and is below city health code? Dr. Ray, is it normal for 14 year olds to get surly and moody and disrespectful? My answer, whether it's normal or not, is irrelevant. The question is, is it good? Sin is normal, it's typical. It pervades the human condition. It's not good. So yeah, a 14-year-old can get surly, but that's not right and good. So the question, is it normal, is replacing, is it right? And that's, that's sad. That's really what's happening. Many parents accept a lot of nasty behavior because they've been told, well, you know, siblings mistreat each other. That's what they do. That's part of sibling rivalry. They're mean to each other. But you know, when they get to be 32, they'll realize how much they love each other and all of that. No, it's not good to mistreat your sibling, even though it's typical. And then your third rule, Brian, that I had was? On a, a focus on effectiveness uh, in the sense of uh, perhaps you were talking about inconsistency and even in maybe not ideal form of discipline if you're consistent is better than nothing at all. There's a simple number of relationships here. The more effective you are in your discipline, and that means you follow through with what you said and you enforce it, 
the less you have to do it. And the less you have to do it, the nicer the relationship. Some of the meanest parents I have ever seen are the kindest parents. That's because they feel guilty about disciplining. They don't want to discipline. They're afraid their kid won't like them. They don't want to do something psychologically incorrect. They just think, why can't we just all love each other and be nice? Well, that'd be great if you were, if you were raising something easy, like a timber wolf, but not when you're raising a kid who needs a lot of guidance and a lot of limits. It's the nature of the beast. It seems in today too that the one thing in vogue is to talk it through with the children. Uh, and you talk about talk as an illusion of discipline and talk is cheap. Um, share your thoughts on just talking and how effective that is or when is that used and shouldn't be used and this whole disciplining. Talk works best when it's backed up. Say, for example, I have a 15 year old who absolutely wants a smartphone and smartphones in the hands of kids are one of the most dangerous things you could possibly do. It's like putting a nuclear warhead in their hand. Okay, they want a smartphone. Now I don't allow that. And there's reasons I don't allow it. And I found out, for example, that, that my son has indeed um, stolen or given, been given a smartphone from one of his friends. I find this out. Okay. So now I discipline this. But then I explain to my son why I'm doing what I'm doing. So the explanation is good. You want to explain. On the other hand, you also want to stand your ground. All too often, we as parents think that if I just explain it, the child will understand it. The child will say, oh, father, I've been so blind. Of course, I see what you're saying. That's why you're the grown up and I'm the child. It's all so clear to me now. Let's hold hands and sing Kumbaya around the campfire. We, we think this is going to happen, but kids don't see parenthood through the eyes of parents. So if you're going to talk, make sure that the talk is accompanied by a standard that you enforce. I can't talk my son into treating his sister nice. I can't. Oh, yeah, there's probably a few kids here and there you could do that with. But what I have to do is to enforce that he's not allowed to mistreat his sister. And then my talk is more effective. You mentioned about parents and guilt and yelling, and they never acted this way until they had children. But um, in that is, you know, they won't listen to me until I yell and scream. So what's going on there? Well, doctor... You know that the body adapts to medication and substances, right? The body says, well, you're going to put that in me. I'm going to, I'm going to compensate. I'm going to, I'm going to go for homeostasis and I'm going to settle myself down and I'll get used to this. It's the same thing with talking. If talking is your only mode of discipline, you're going to have to get louder and louder to get any kind of cooperation because the child habituates to the words. And pretty soon, he habituates to the volume. Now you're a screaming lunatic to try to get anybody to pay attention to you. If you only use words, it's like a drug. The children will just simply habituate to the drug, and you got to use more words with more volume and more emotion to get the same level of cooperation, and eventually you won't even get that. Is negotiation a good form of discipline? Depends what you're negotiating about. If, for example, I say, tell you what, tell you what, I know you've been at school all day. Okay, you got homework. Uh, I'll tell you, here, take an hour, do what you want to do. I think that's fair, uh, but then you got to do your schoolwork. Okay, I mean, you can negotiate with kid, a kid on things that you find as a parent are not critical to their moral well-being, not critical to their responsibility maturity. Let's say my my 11 year old comes to me and says, hey dad, why do I gotta go to bed at nine o'clock? I, I, you know, I laid there for 45 minutes until I fall asleep. And I think about this and I say, yeah, you know what? You're, you're right, you're right, son. Yeah, go, go to bed at 9.30, that's fine. You're 11 years old, you're, you're right. So when you negotiate, it's because you've thought it through and you've said, yeah, 
I can be flexible on this. Of course I can. Uh, but all too often what tends to happen is parents will negotiate on something they know they shouldn't negotiate on. And they only negotiate because they're being badgered. For example, I'll give you a small example of this. Many parents will say, now the average age of a smartphone, Brian, do you, do you know what it is now in American culture? Yeah, yeah. Go, go. It's about nine. It's about nine. Oh. So a parent of, say, for example, more traditional morals says, there's no way that's going to happen in my home. That is, that's lunacy. It's not going to happen. So the child starts nagging, let's say at age 10 or 11, because he or she sees all the friends have one. He's nagging. The parent's holding out. The parent is saying, no way, no way, no how. The child's nagged for three years now. Child is 13. The parent finally acquiesces and says, well, okay, I've stood my ground for three years. I would rather not give you a cell phone, a smartphone until you're 15 or 16. I would just rather not do that. If anything, I'm going to give you a flip phone. But the parent says, okay, 13. Now that's a negotiation against the parent's better judgment, but they did it because they were worn down. Right. There's the difference. I can relate to that. You know, hey, worn down is a good term. You're just exhausted. Mm -hmm. and, um, and yet how important in all this is consistency? Well, what I'll tell parent, for example, just to digress for a moment on the cell phone thing, as they're being badgered, periodically, relentlessly, I will tell the parent, please tell your child, uh, Bell, Alexander, uh, my giving you a smartphone really depends upon what I think your maturity and trustworthiness is. So as long as you continue to nag me about this, I'm going to push the age back because your nagging is showing me you're not ready. That's really shuts kids up real fast. Just go ahead, keep nagging because now you're just making it longer That's rather good. than making it shorter. That's a good point, a uh, good response because uh, the kids do badger you and wear you down. And yet by showing, by you doing this shows uh, your immaturity and you're not ready for it. That, that's a great, uh, mm -hmm. that's a great comeback. Um, you mentioned for preschoolers, one of the suggestions in the form of discipline was uh, sitting in a corner and older children writing an essay. Could you elucidate on that a little bit? Most, most, most misbehavior is routine. It just happens all the time. Uh, whether for a three-year-old, it's defiance whether for a six-year-old, it is arguing, whether for an 11-year-old, it is, I'm not doing my chores, whatever it is, it's repetitive. It happens a lot. So the parent needs a go-to consequence, something they don't have to think about, something they can use two, three, four, five, six times a day if they have to. So a corner, you got four of those in every room. That's a great consequence. I don't have to think about it. If you're going to be defiant, if I ask you to do something, you start arguing with me and I simply say, hey, go to the corner, please. I don't have to think, okay, what am I going to do about this now? Let's see. I took his, I took his blocks away yesterday. Now, when do, the, when do those blocks come back? I think they come back tomorrow. No? Well, I didn't write it down. I'm going to forget. Okay, should I? Well, maybe I'll take his puzzles away. That'll be good. I'll take it. Well, with the puzzles, no, the puzzles are right. See, what happens is you get confused. Parents will say that. They'll say, I can't think of a consequence fast enough. Well, you don't have to. If you've got your basic daily consequence, for example, an essay on disrespect for a mouthy 12-year-old, oh, you could use that anytime. You can use it any length. You can use it handwritten. You can use it, uh, my, my wife used to grade it for grammar. <laughs> she used to do that. Yeah, and hand it back to him and said, you know what? You might want to work on your sentence structure here. <laughs> so yeah it's, it's a go-to everyday easily relied upon consequence the simpler it is the more likely we are to do it and the more likely we are to do it the better it works one word in uh, my vocabulary that uh, you don't hear much these days is spanking uh, share with us your 
thoughts and your experience with that? When is it okay? What? Why isn't it? Why does today they say it's terrible that it's going to ruin the children? In our culture, which is deciding what new morality is, three sins that are left is uh, smoking, spanking, and having more than 1.86 children. Those are the terrible sins now in our culture. The interesting thing about the research on spanking, first of all, the vast majority of experts, I'd say probably 80 to 90%, just think spanking is hideous evil, awful, terrible. And it has been slammed with all kinds of indictments. You're teaching the children to be aggressive. You're showing might breaks might. Uh, your autocratic power, you're not teaching anything. It's a form of child abuse, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these are all theoretical injunctions. The reality is there is no evidence anywhere of a solid nature that says a swat or two, a spank or so in a loving home when done by a loving parent for certain infractions causes any kind of problems whatsoever ever. Now, I tell parents, spanking can't be your main mode of discipline because kids misbehave too much. You know, you got a four-year-old, they, they misbehave 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 times a day. What are you going to do? You're going to spank them 20 times a day? You can't do that. All right. So you use spanking as a spice, as something that you rely upon if and when there's a certain kind of infraction. It usually fades out by the time the child is six, seven, or eight. It goes away because you have other consequences that are more durable. But the idea that if you swat a bottom, you're evil incarnate as a parent is absolutely flat out unsupported by the literature. Interestingly enough, we did a, my second book was called Back to the Family. And we did a nationwide search, Brian, for strong families nominated by state teachers of the year. We asked them all about their parenting. 70% of them said, we did spank when the kids were younger. We do spank now because we have younger kids and we will spank. So 70% of the absolute best parents that a teacher had ever seen with the most admirable children that the teacher had ever seen had said, yeah, yeah, we spank. Uh, we, we have, it's not our main discipline, but, but occasionally, yeah, it happens. So I think that's a, a living testimony for the hyper overreaction we've gotten into. I'm not advising parents to spank. It's not my decision. It's your house. You do what you want. I'm simply saying that this is a classic example of the experts paralyzing parents. Right. You mentioned in your book with all this confusion of parents and how to best handle their kids, uh, use the phrase uh, I thought was cute, parentis maximus wimpus. Uh, share that, what you meant with that. <laughs> well, I figure you being in the medical field, you know, you guys always have these fancy no, Latin. Latin names that make it sound like, man, hyperhidrosis. Oh, man, he's got that. Yeah, that's sweating. You know, so, so you guys do that to make you sound smart. It, it so allows I figure I better throw one of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I throw that in. I said, parenthesis maximus wimpus. I said that, in fact, it's a parent who is nervous and second guessing and afraid to actually discipline for fear of the child's reaction. And interestingly enough, Brian, that affliction uh, really starts to gain uh, virulence when the kids hit 12, 13, 14, 15. And the reason for that is parents are worried because as their child sees the peer group and the freedoms the peer group have and the technological advantages, quote unquote, that the peer group has, so often the kids look at the parent who's trying to hold the ground, who's trying to slow down the pace of growing up with resentment, with anger, with how did I get stuck with you, you Neanderthal? How can all those parents be wrong and you be right? So what tends to happen is even though the parents believe in their deepest part of their gut, what they should do, they cave because they're afraid. 
They are afraid of how the child is going to react. He's going to dislike me. He's going to get sneaky. He's going to get resentful. He's going to run wild when he's 19. All of these fears make parents act against their own best teaching and the child's best interests. Ray, before we close it up today, um, any closing thoughts you'd want to give to the parents out there? You know, they're struggling and they, they're they just kind of lost. Uh, they, they even go to counselors and they're getting this, some of this advice is scary. Um, I ask parents, you want to raise an average child or do you want to raise a one in a hundred child morally, responsibly, maturely? Every single parent I've ever talked to, I want to raise a one in a hundred child. Okay. Then you're going to have to be a one in a hundred parent. You can't parent like the culture anymore. The culture is raising kids in a way that is not good. So if you are trying to teach a child to love God, to embrace morals, to be mature, to be one in a hundred, much of what you do is going to be countercultural. That six-year-old does not have video games. That 13-year-old doesn't have a smartphone. You pray out in restaurants, in public, in front of people. Nobody does that. So, so much of what you do as a parent is going to look odd, eccentric, weird, maybe to your family members, maybe to your own parents, to your own kids. But know that in the long run, what you are doing has the best chance of success. I always tell parents, if your kids go astray, and in this culture, many of them do, you want it to be because they had to go through you not because you stepped aside. That's very good. Very good. Well, Dr. Ray, I want to thank you so much for joining me today on Mercy Unbound. To all those watching this, I would strongly encourage you to go to drray, drray.com. And this book, Discipline That Lasts a Lifetime, it's got a lot of wonderful, great ideas in it. We are sure hoping to get Dr. Ray back real soon. I I've got the book. I haven't read it yet. But we're going to have another great interview on marriage, uh, another institution that's uh, struggling in its own right. Ryan, what am I doing here? Am I therapizing you? Is this free advice? I didn't yeah. even charge you for this. I never told you how bad I need you, Dr. Ray. <laughs> I, got, I saw the petition. People were writing me left and right. I bet. I bet it was thousands. <laughs> but I do thank you for joining us. And um, to all the listeners, continue to watch us at um, drbryan, B-R-Y-A-N, Thatcher.com. You can listen to the podcast at anchor.fm slash Thatcher. Go to Dr. Ray's website, drray, drray.com. Get some of his books. And uh, Ray, we look forward to seeing you back. And thank you again so much. Brian, can't thank you enough. I'll talk to you again. Thank you. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for the video portion. The podcast can be heard at anchor.fm slash drbryan, B-R-Y-A-N, Thatcher, T-H-A-T-C-H-E-R, and on all the major podcast forums. I would love to speak at your church or conference, and please consider supporting our efforts to spread the truth to a hurting world. Thank you again, and for more information, go to the website at drbryanthatcher.com.